Alright, here we go with our first set of video notes in our oceanography unit. This one is going to be on the formation of the oceans and talk a little bit about the properties of water. Uh, double check with the video description on the web page to see what page you're supposed to be doing this on. Remember, we're going to use the Cornell Notes format, so most of you guys should be familiar with that. Um, so do the Cornell Notes. You can pause as you need to to get those filled in. Basically anything that I write down or that's written on this slide is something you should be putting in your notes and use those um, uh, slide headings as your key terms on the left. And then when you're all done, don't forget to head on over to Quizstar and take your video quiz. Here we have just a little bit of a review of some of the things you guys learned in your timeline. Uh, we talked about the Earth forming 4.5 or 4.6 billion years ago. Uh, something we haven't talked about before is the Big Bang. Um, other than being my favorite TV show, about 13 billion years ago, so this is the formation of the universe. Some of the main things that I, that I really, really, really want you to know are the ones that are in bold. So knowing that the oceans formed about 4 billion years ago. And then some of the other things, first life about 3.8 billion years ago. And then oxygen still only 3 billion years ago. Multicellular life, so this stuff up here we're talking about is just like bacteria or whatever. Multicellular life uh, a billion years ago which is a long time, but still, you know, a quarter of the way through, as you guys probably saw in your timeline. First fish, 500 million years. Plants soon after that at 475. First mammals didn't arrive till 200 million years. And then modern humans, so Homo sapiens, only 250,000 years ago. And so I'm sure you saw in your timeline that you probably had a hard time even putting that number on your timeline because it was so small. We're just a blink of an eye in the history of the Earth. A little bit about the formation of the oceans. First, where did the water come from? Two main sources of water to the main ideas. Uh, the first one being off-gassing from volcanoes, so the gas shooting out of volcanoes. And if you look down here, you can see um, all the stuff that's in volcanic gases. Um, hydrochloric acid, hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, and then water vapor makes up the vast majority. I mean, if you look down here, the scale is a logarithmic scale, so down here we're looking at like 90% or something like that. A lot of it is water, so, you know, the history of the Earth was very volcanic at first, so that's probably a major source of the water. And then we probably had some contributed from ice from comets, you know, the Earth was being battered by things in the early early days, lots of intergalactic stuff slamming into the earth, and so it would have been ice from comets that could have contributed some water as well. So that explains where the water came from, but how did the ocean basins get to be where they are now, the basin being like the bowl of water in the ocean, so like the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean, things like that. And you guys saw in your timeline again that the continents have moved around. You guys put Pangaea on there and Gondwana lands so of the different formations. So, and you've probably heard this before, you know, plate tectonics, um, all these plates moving around all the time. Um, and over time, they've, you know, had giant oceans and smaller oceans and things like that. Some kind of cool videos to help demonstrate this here. Uh, this one, first one on plate tectonics, so this kind of describes the process of how plate, te plate tectonics works. It happens because hot rock rises, heated by the Earth's core. Near the surface, the rock spreads in two directions and goes sideways. It begins to lose heat. Eventually, the much cooler rock sinks back down. Through this spreading process, the Earth's crust is very slowly dragged apart. And it's this that ultimately causes the continents to move. Where the plates collide, the rock on the seafloor containing carbon from the dead plankton is carried deep into the Earth. As it descends, this layer of rock is heated, so the rock melts, releasing carbon dioxide. And gas is returned back into the atmosphere during an eruption. The remarkable cycle is complete. So, kind of cool, huh? 
So that convection current, so moving those plates, you know, some are constantly spreading, and then on the obviously on the other end of the spread, it can't go forever, it has to go somewhere else, and eventually it collapses down. This next one is just kind of a neat little thing. This um, shows you what the continents have been doing, and then what they will be doing. We predict in the future. So kind of cool. So there's Pangea, which you guys put on your timeline already. So already this looks pretty familiar to us, and you can see that we're starting to go in the future now. So, based on past data, it looks like we may end up with another giant Pangea sometime in the future, way after we're gone though, of course. So a little bit of terminology we saw in that video with some plates spreading apart and some moving together. When plates are spreading apart, we call that a divergent plate boundary. So these guys are diverging from each other, moving away. Um, we also have convergent would be the opposite, when plates move towards each other. And then specifically, you have subduction when one plate goes underneath another one. You saw that um, in the second half of the video when it showed the volcanoes forming. When one plate is kind of going underneath, it's going this way and rubbing up against another plate. So this guy is subducting. This plate here is subducting underneath this one. Sub means underneath. And then if you have plates that are moving along next to each other, like what we see over here, we've got transform, um, plates moving next to each other. Sometimes it's also called a strike-slip fault or a transverse fault. So now we'll switch gears and start talking a little bit more specifically about water and some of its properties. The most important thing about water is that it's a polar molecule, which means that it's slightly positive and slightly negative. Right? Overall, the water molecule doesn't have a charge. This may seem familiar to you because we talked about it in Biology 1. But the oxygen, as you may recall, is much, much bigger, and it pulls those electrons a little bit closer to it, so it's slightly negative, and the hydrogen being slightly positive, and then what happens when you have opposite charges next to each other? Well, they attract a little bit, and that's what's going on there. So you have some hydrogen bonds, so these weak bonds um, with hydrogen atoms. So not a really strong bond, but it's, it's enough of a force to help hold that oxygen to that hydrogen, and that causes some interesting things causes surface tension, which you guys probably know, like water skippers walking on the water, when we, or if you ever floated a paper clip in a dish of water. The adhesion and cohesion, where adhesion being water sticking to other things, co meaning together, cohesion, water molecules sticking to each other. A little bit about the ice structure, which we'll talk about in a sec, but the fact that ice floats. And then water is also a really great solvent, means it dissolves things really, really well. These are all really, really unique properties of water, and they're also pretty handy. So again, that ice structure, we talk about ice floats, we probably take that for granted, but if you've ever seen like um, dry ice, which is frozen carbon dioxide, it sinks. It's actually pretty unique for the solid form of something to float. And you see down here the molecules are much less, um, much less dense, so it's less dense than water, liquid water, and so that allows it to float. And who cares? Why does that matter? Well, one, it provides a habitat for hunting and foraging, so the polar bear especially relies on 
being able to walk on the water, walk on the ice, and looking for seals and stuff like that in the holes. Other critters might be looking for algae that grows on the other underside of the ice, so fish from underneath or other mammals eating that algae. Uh, also because it floats, it creates like a protective blanket, so if you think of like a pond, imagine if ice sank, well you would have a freezing layer and then that would sink down to the bottom and A, probably crush a lot of stuff, but then that would leave more water on top to freeze and then that would sink and then another layer would sink and eventually you'd have a giant ice cube instead of a pond that you could go ice fishing in and the fish could live in year round. So they probably appreciate the fact that ice floats. Uh, water also has something called a high specific heat. The specific heat is the amount of energy a substance can absorb. And so it's actually water can absorb a lot of energy. You can kind of see some of the other things here that can absorb less energy than water. So water is among the highest, which means it takes a lot of energy to change its temperature. And so that helps water modify the climate. For an example, you can look at our weather here in Oregon. Right, right now, this map here was taken from the summer temperatures. So here's Salem. So you're looking at 87 degrees, and a lot of you guys probably know this. It could be beautiful here, and you go to the coast, and you freeze your butt off. Right, You're wearing your shorts and maybe your tank top, and you go there, and you want your jeans and your sweatshirt, because now you're looking at 64 degrees. Why is that? Because the Pacific Ocean is cold. Right, That temperature doesn't change very easily and that can absorb energy from the wind that's moving over the ocean and that makes it colder. So really, really cold here and then it can warm up over here. So it modifies the climate. Then you have the exact opposite thing in the winter. We could have really, really cold days where it's like 35, 40 degrees, but it's still probably 50 or 60 over at the coast because that's pretty much the temperature of the water. So this plays a huge role in the climate of the globe. And then the last thing we're going to talk about today is light in the ocean and how water affects that. So blue light has the most energy, red light has the least. So if you look at your wavelengths over here, so think of gamma rays, ultraviolet, shorter wavelength means more energy, infrared has less energy, right? Lots and lots of energy. So which type of light is going to disappear first? Which type of light is going to um, go the deepest? Well. The blue light has the most energy, so it's going to go the deepest. Red light has less energy, so it can't penetrate as far. It doesn't go down as deep. So red light is absorbed first, and the blue right light reaches the deep. So this is part of the reason why water looks blue. But it's kind of neat because animals take advantage of this. This jellyfish here is actually red in color. Now, since there's no red light actually reaching it, right? if it's at 100 meters, you know, if it's going to be down, way down here, is there any red light? Nope. So there's no red light to reflect off of it, so therefore it's basically invisible. So even though it has color when we go down to a submarine and shine light on it, most things down there is not going to be able to see it because there's no red light to reflect it. So animals have evolved to take advantage of this property of water. So with that, uh, that wraps up these notes. Don't forget to go and take your quiz and check for your due dates on the website.